because that's how library land works. We know everybody's given you know their birth names and not their nicknames. But I was really excited to find out that he wrote this book and that they were wanting to come to the Clawbrook Free Library and have their first book talk. I'm really excited. So without further ado, Bob Brush and Mel Harris. <laughs> I, clearly, I'm Mel and he's Bob. It's not always clear to people because I have a boy's name, but um, is, is volume okay? Can everybody hear? Yes. That's really important. So, um, well, I live with this guy and uh, a number of years ago he talked about changing from screenwriting to writing novels, which was his love. And it was really interesting to see the differences in process and we can talk about that as we go along and questions and all that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little, we're gonna read a little, we're gonna take some questions. If you have questions after the stories, it's great. Then we're gonna read some more and we're gonna talk some more and we're gonna do that. So hopefully it'll be enjoyable and you'll understand it. So I'm gonna pass it over to Bob who will talk a little bit about where he wanted to go when he started. Uh, first of all, uh, buona sera, uh, uh, bienvenu bien benvenuto, uh, mi amici, and that will uh, conclude the Italian portion <laughs> of this presentation. But seriously, if there's anyone in the audience who speaks Italian, there are Italian phrases in the stories that we're going to try to butcher our way through. Forgive us. Um, for those of you who haven't read the novel and uh, probably for some of you who have, uh, too loud? I think so. Right. Too loud? The uh, the piazza is a uh, a store is a novel within stories. There, are, it's made up of stories that interconnect and interweave through the through the book. Um, and uh, I wrote it because. I have a great, great love for the Italian culture and the Italian people. I started visiting there when I was uh, uh, 18, and I've gone back again and again, and I think it is one of the most unique and beautiful cultures that I know of. I don't think that this book could have existed in, in any other place than in Italy. So um, as we know, it's about a, a little boy, Niccolo, and his parents. If it is true that each memory casts a shadow forever, let one shadow be that of a boy. The boy stands in the center of a busy square beneath a summer sun. He is eight years of age. Around him there is noise and dust, the rattle of horses and carts, chickens and goats, hawkers and vendors, argument and opinion, the joyous gabbling of life in a place that no longer exists, if it ever existed at all. The square is, was, called Piazza Santa Caterina Piccola, on the outskirts of Monte Castella, a small Italian hill town up the road from a much larger town from which a railroad leads to the great cities of Rome, Milan, and Naples. Narrow streets wind down the hill to the cobblestone piazza, which is encircled by shops, a bakery, a barber shop, a macelleria, a cafe. There is a hotel, the Grand Hotel Imperial, built in a folly of optimism years before, but still beneath its flags, the proud emblem of a certain sardonic civic pride. Across the square stands a church, Catholic, naturally, and in its shadow, a small stone shelter. The year is 1933. There is a movie theater, recently renamed Cinema Duce in honor of Rome's latest candidate for immortality, Benito Mussolini, and a statue of Giuseppe Garibaldi, beneath which lies the town well, where anything important, or anything not, is discussed, dissected, and ratified by the women who come to do laundry. There are still more horses than automobiles, more rumors than telephones, more goats than politicians. There are no soldiers. Not yet. In the center of this is the boy standing on his shadow. His name is Niccolo. He lives above the bakery, which is run by his mother and his grandfather since Niccolo's father left for America in search of a new life for them all. Niccolo was born here. This place is his world. Years from now, when the town of Monte Castella has vanished in a conflagration of politics and war, he will remember the stories of the people and things that were here. He will remember life and death, love and remorse, the unutterable magic of a very small place in a perilous time. Piazza Piccolo is where everything in these stories took place. All of it happened. None of it is true. <laughs> All right, 
as we said, the story is, it centers around uh, Niccolo and his family, and that thread runs through the book. But there are many, many other characters in the book. But let's begin with Niccolo's view. Everyone knew everything. Is this me? No. Did but you? if you really wanted, no, you I wrote it, I so, know. okay. Sorry, I'm done with it. I already said it, so. Okay. Everyone knew everything about everyone else on Piazza Piccola, or thought they did, which was very much the same thing. From Mama's Bakery window, Niccolo could, in the course of a day, account for most of the local populace as they crossed the square, enacted their business, argued, laughed, pulled their suspenders, stroked their beards, made threats, shook hands, and, when the occasion called for it, lied. Behind each face lurked a story, only occasionally based on fact, which forever defined its owner. Thus, Libertini, the Iceman, was famous for having six fingers on one hand. Morelli, the vegetable seller, for talking to his horse. Biggio, the barber's great uncle, was Giuseppe, Joe the boss, Masseria, who died in a blast of gunfire on Coney Island. Who did not know that the widow Patacci once sat behind Greta Garbo on a bus in downtown Naples? Or that Bruno Fabra, the stable master, kept the sayings of Il Duce on his nightstand? To which no, no. Niccolo's grandfather, applied the old proverb, which I won't read in Italian. He that goes to Rome a fool returns a fool. No, no, Niccolo was certain, was anything but a fool. To Niccolo, it seemed his grandfather, who had been alive forever and surely would be, was the, would always be, was the wisest man on Piazza Piccola, therefore in Italy, therefore on earth. Barely five feet high, with hands like iron sledges, Nono worked in the bakery six days a week, hauling sacks of flour and tending the oven while Mama dealt with the customers, kept the books, and ran the shop. At night, Nono slept on a pallet in the storeroom, snoring uproariously and shouting in his sleep. Sundays, as the Bible suggested, he rested. He had no use for the church, sitting by the radio, smoking and shaking his head at the news from Rome. And although he was hardly a conversationalist, Fine words don't feed cats, he would snort. In the case of his grandson, he made an exception. With Niccolo on his knee, Nana would tell of growing up in a place not so far distant, yet in customs and people, a universe apart from the small world of Mama's bakery. Of his life as a blacksmith, then a soldier, a prize fighter, and even an acrobat. To Niccolo, Nano's life read like a storybook, exotic, burly, wild. The best part was when Mama, listening, would titch at the more colorful chapters, hiss at Nano, bang the pots, and send Niccolo to bed. There were other things as well his grandfather taught Niccolo, things a father might have done, but Papa was now an ocean away. Nano showed Niccolo how to set traps for mice, whittle with a pocket knife, and when Mama wasn't around, chew tobacco and pee in the sink. Once, when they discovered an abandoned litter of kittens beneath the stairs outside the storeroom, Niccolo begged Nano to keep them. Nano refused and drowned them in a vat of water. It was Niccolo's first lesson in cruelty and death, and he made up his mind to hate his grandfather forever. But time went by, and Nano was kind, so eventually Niccolo forgave him and sat on his lap again while Nano told him the kind of things boys need to hear to become bigger boys. When Nano spoke like this, Niccolo always listened. Now this story goes on and gets into, begins to get into the story of Niccolo and uh, a particular Statue of Liberty that he uh, receives as a gift from Papa in New York. It's very precious, and his father says, take care of it. But on a jaunt, which will be mentioned here, but we're not going to read that part of the story, he, uh, Niccolo and his friends who have gone to spy on, on the rumor that the butcher's beautiful wife took a bath every afternoon, on their way to see that, they get caught by the butcher, and the, the statue falls out of Niccolo's pocket, the head comes off of the Statue of Liberty and falls into the grate in the piazza. And so Niccolo uh, has to deal with the terror and guilt, not only of having beheaded the Statue of Liberty, but <laughs> letting his father down. Uh, and that story runs through the novel. But these, in, in order to give you a sense of the book, we're going to skip from, that in the, from uh, Niccolo now to some of the other characters that have equal standing in the book. There, we mentioned uh, Morelli, who speaks to his horse, and his horse talks back. There's Isabel Andaloro, a blind, silent movie accompanist that nobody knows is blind. Monsignor Don Federico and his nemesis, Fausto the Fool, who sweeps the piazza and really was the first character who came to me one day in Italy uh, and is kind of the center of the book. Finally, there are the black shirts. 
the, the first tentacles of fascism working its way up from Rome, the, the black shirts who began, who later began to terrorize uh, everything and were the precursor to the invasion of the, the, the Germans and then, and then the US as well and the destruction of the town. Anyway, uh, I thought what we'd do is go to the story of one of the characters, my favorite characters, a pickpocket, Il Borsigitore, Il Borsigitore the pickpocket. Let us imagine that Giuseppe Rosario Almonte began his life in Milan, the youngest of 14 siblings, whose father, Luigi Almonte, made a decent living as a borsigiatore, that is to say, a pickpocket. Let us further imagine that all 14 of Luigi's sons and daughters chose to follow in their father's footsteps. This flood of light fingers Almontes onto the local market resulted in a glut forcing the younger siblings ever outward in search of more fertile territories. By the time Giuseppe, the youngest and by far the most talented of the clan, was ready to assume his station, not only, not only Milan, but most of the towns and cities around had been picked clean. Hardly a street corner or crowded nightclub remained where a gifted young fingersmith might ply his trade. So at the age of 15, Giuseppe, like a young lion, set off across Italy in search of unspoiled territory in which to practice his craft. After many adventures, he stumbled upon an insignificant piazza on the outskirts of a no less insignificant town. And here the young man sends the canvas on which to paint his masterpiece. And here on Piazza Santa Caterina Piccola, Giuseppe Almonte flourished. His talents at the art of ledger domain, as mentioned, were prodigious. The young man, as seen, was born to relieve others of their possessions. His hands were like Ali D'Angelo, the wings of an angel. He never missed a mark and was never caught, though many had their suspicions. And although the local population was hardly dripping with wealth, between the occasional guest at the Grand Hotel Imperial or the late night crowd of drunks at the cafe, Giuseppe gleaned enough to keep himself comfortable. When cash was required, he simply strolled down the Via Venti in the evening, filched a wallet or lifted a watch, senza problemi. All in all, life for Giuseppe Almonte was comfortable, perhaps for an artist too comfortable. Over time, as with any skilled artisan at the peak of his powers, Giuseppe began to look for new challenges. Like Paderewski scale playing the scales, the simple picking of pockets had become child's play. So to keep his interest from flagging, Giuseppe set obstacles to overcome. For a time, he limited himself to only lifting diamond rings, then only necklaces, then only those with natural pearls. When that grew stale, he moved to spectacles, buttons, and barrettes, and after that, cufflinks and bow ties. But despite these challenges, he continued to be bored. He filched musical instruments out from under their owner's gaze, violins, trumpets, once even a bass drum, though it being the only bass drum on Piazza Piccolo, he returned it in time for the annual San Gennaro Parade, after which he stole it again. He tried working blindfolded, then walking backwards, then with gloves on. He made off with the mayor's shoelaces, and when the police chief came to investigate, Giuseppe lifted the police chief's toupee. He purloined the widow Patachi's corsets in broad daylight. Yet even these reckless diversions seemed to Giuseppe no more than parlor tricks. A terrible thought began to haunt him. Perhaps at his young age, he'd reached a dead end. There was nothing, it seemed, he couldn't steal. Worse, there was nothing to steal, which he had not already stolen at least once before. Perhaps he was doomed to spend the rest of his life repeating the past. Then one evening, purely by accident, he stumbled upon the grail he had been seeking. Like so many other things of great value in life, it was found in the eyes of a beautiful girl. She sat alone, weeping into her napkin at Minucci's outdoor cafe on a night lit with stars and the sparks from Minucci's smoke pots, meant to mask the smell of the stables next door. Nearby sat Giuseppe Almonte, sipping a glass of fine Chianti compliments of a businessman who somewhere across town was just now realizing that his wallet was missing. Giuseppe watched as the young woman dabbed her eyes. Even from a distance, her grief was palpable, almost as if it had heft and volume. As to the nature of the grief, there was no telling. Loss, betrayal, infidelity, disappointment, death, whatever the cause, it clung to her like an amulet of sorrow. The napkin slept from her lip. In a flash, he was on his feet, stooping to grab the napkin before it drifted onto the pavement. Permette, signorina, your napkin, he smiled. She turned. He handed her the napkin, and in that moment, with a single deft swipe of his hand, 
lifted her from the strand, lifted from her the strands of her terrible grief. And this was the remarkable thing. By the time the young woman had replaced the napkin on her lap, her tears had begun to dry. Her sighs diminished, her absent smile returned. Reaching for her wine, as if suddenly reawakening to her surroundings, it occurred to her to thank the gentleman who had handed her the napkin. But by then, by all good thieves, he had left the scene in possession of a treasure no pickpocket in history had ever before possessed. Let us now imagine that having plucked a thing as, as insubstantial as a young woman's grief out from beneath her very eyes, Giuseppe might have been content to rest on his laurels and return to the getting of cash. <laughs> After all, what was grief work on, worth on the open market? The supply of sorrow in the world was overstocked. No competent fence would touch it. And yet there was something in its smooth and liquid evanescence that drew Giuseppe to it and made it treasure. That very evening, he acquired from the luggage of a Polish countess a jewelry box made of ivory lined with silk and inset with diamonds and rubies. In this, he set his prize and went to bed. And when that night Giuseppe dreamt, great vistas opened before him. Like Columbus on the coast of Spain, a new world beckoned. The next day, Giuseppe set sail. That afternoon, he made off with an old man's regrets. A night later, a night later, a young tough braggadocio. On Sunday, a single hour at mass netted him a wife's despair, a young boy's shame, and a lawyer's hypocrisy, though the lawyer, it turned out, had more where that came from. A coward's fear, a miser's greed, a gossip's spite. One afternoon, Giuseppe plucked the bitterness from the mouths of an angry father and son. One by one, these treasures found their way into the box by his bed. Now, some things he found were harder to steal than others. Patience and hope clung to their, their owners like nettles, valorable, Valor was inseparable from its host. And when it came to virginity, Giuseppe left well enough alone. <laughs> Even so, as weeks passed, the box at his bedside began to fill until one afternoon when he returned to his apartment to find an invitation slipped under the door. The name of the gentleman awaiting him in the dining room of the Grand Hotel Imperiale was Don Roberto Civelli, a man of respect who had traveled to Monte Castello from the south, perhaps from as far away as Sicily. The roughness of his complexion was matched by the perfection of his fingernails. Instantly, Giuseppe recognized the man's name and titled and admired his suit, on which the gleaming buttons were pearl. Maestro, began the Don, word has reached me of your accomplishments. All due respect, replied Giuseppe. I fear your journey has been in vain. I, I have no accomplishments to speak of. Of course, smiled Don Roberto. The wrinkles around his eyes were pleat with the shadows of a hundred deaths. Be that as it may, since I have journeyed this far, perhaps you might consider indulging an old man a favor. And although these words were the cloak of request, was, uh, wore the cloak of request, it was clear the, that hidden beneath the cloak was a dagger of ultimatum. Whatever may be in my power, replied Giuseppe. Don Roberto poured the wine. I have had in my life a great deal of success, much of it wrenched from the bones and teeth of my enemies. Now near the end of that life, I find myself laden with wealth and influence, but something else as well. I am speaking of my sins. They chafe, they itch. At night, they make a noise like a howling wolf. Can you relieve me of them? For that, you would need a priest. I prefer, yourself. sorry about no, that. Sorry. I prefer to leave the church out of it, replied the Don. I have been known to have enemies there. He smiled again. Do this and I will make you rich. Giuseppe hesitated. Don Roberto leaned forward. Try, he said, I urge you. His eyes fell on Giuseppe's hands. Such hands, I have heard them compared to Alidangelo, the wings of an angel. What a shame it would be to see them made idle. On the contrary, said Giuseppe, at which Don Roberto noticed his cufflinks had disappeared, after which it occurred to him his pearl buttons were gone. The color rose in his face. Enough of the parlor tricks, he growled. Will you do this or not? Giuseppe arose from his chair. What makes you think I have it? He asked. He bowed and left. That night, Giuseppe dropped the padrino sins into the ivory box by his bed and paused to admire them. Next to the other treasures, the sins looked wretched, gnarled, deformed. Perhaps because of this, Giuseppe felt a sudden fondness for them. Content with his day's work, he slept. Across the piazza, however, Don Roberto did not. Through the long night he thrashed and moaned, besieged with nightmares, taunted by specters of humiliation, impotence, and castration. For what is a man like Don Roberto without his sins? 
By morning, a second invitation found its way under Giuseppe's door. I want them back, the haggard Don said that night. I will pay any price. The trouble was that Giuseppe had by this time become attached to the small misshapen things. Perhaps just cufflinks and pearls, he suggested. Screw the cufflinks and pearls, said the Don. You have my sins. I want them back. Giuseppe considered his options, though perhaps he should not have. The problem is, he lied, I sold them to a fence, a man I do not know, who took them away and won't tell me where. Find him, said the padrino. And if I cannot? I urge you to do so. A man without his sins is like a pickpocket without his hands. And though his words were unmistakable, Giuseppe refused to accept their meaning. Surely, he imagined, a man of his gifts need not be dictated to by a common thug. Such is the hubris and the fallacy of the artist. Still, hours later, in the moonlit, moonlit quiet of his apartments, the thought occurred that perhaps his achievements had, in fact, reached a culmination. Having dared to trespass upon the Lord's own domain, where to go from there? Perhaps the moment had come to effect a final sleight of hand, a tour de force, and so he did. By morning, Giuseppe Alamante was gone from Piazza Piccolo. No one saw him leave nor did a trace remain of the hundreds of earrings, purses, and amulets he had stolen. All of it simply disappeared, along with Giuseppe and his ivory box, just like that, nil nulla, into thin air. Rumors surfaced. Some reported Giuseppe living in Naples, Peking, or New York. Some reported him king of a small nation in Africa. Some reported him wealthy, some dead. None could be confirmed. Let us imagine, however, that several years later, following a period of worldwide conflagration, a young man who had spent time on, pizza, on, on Piazza Piccola found himself traversing a bustling street in the ancient city of Tunis. There in a doorway, he spotted a seated figure of such wretchedness <coughs> that at first the young man recoiled in disgust. The figure beckoned to him, not with his hands, but with his eyes from which radiated an almost hypnotic power. Drawn against his will, the young wanderer stepped forward, in the shadows, the stench was overwhelming. Rats and scarabs rustled among the stones. Well, boomed the young man, loudly to allay his unease. What have you got for me? The wretch spoke almost inaudibly. Un tesoro, he croaked, a treasure, unico, more precious than black gold, opal or gold. The young man doubted this, given the fellow's moth-eaten beggar's robe. Nonetheless, held in place by the stranger's eyes, he felt a compulsion to know more. Let me see, he said. The wretch nodded. With a quick movement beneath the tattered cloak, he pushed forward a box made of ivory, now chipped and cracked, once encrusted with jewels, though those had for some time been lost or stolen or sold. How much will you give me? The box, said the young man, is worth very little. The wretch shook his head with a sigh of ineffable sadness. And sin, he said. What is sin? From beneath his cloak, he reached out to open the lid not with his hands, before he had no hands. Instead, from the end of his arms, extended two battered hooks. With these, he grasped the lid and pulled it open. The young man looked in, then drew back in horror. What are they? The wretch smiled. When he spoke, his voice rang with a deep and indomitable pride. Ali D'Angelo, the wings of angels, he boasted. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, where, your, where the idea originally came from? In this? Sure. Well, as I mentioned, I've been going to Italy for years and years, and uh, uh, something like this had always been on my mind, the, 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 the fool Fausto from the, the novel. I, first, I had seen him on the streets of somewhere, maybe San Gimignano, I'm not sure. It stayed in my mind. But then I got involved in in other things and, and, uh, and didn't get around to it. But when I, when I finally pivoted from uh, doing television, right near the end of the time that I was doing The Wonder Years, I began to be kind of haunted by these characters who kept coming to me and saying, uh, do us. So, um, is this the time to tell the story about? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, one of the first things that I did when, when The Wonder Years had which is a TV show, some of you know, had, had finished, uh, is I had to go pitch new stories, a new show to, to the network at ABC. Uh, 
So uh, we set up that appointment, and I walked into the office of, uh, well, Bob Iger was there, who's now the head of Disney, and it was a, a bunch of network executives looking for me to come and pitch them either the next Wonder Years or Mannix or uh, 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 The Facts of Life. And instead, I pitched them a story about a little piazza in Italy in 1933, shot in black and white, in Italian, with subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, it was one of the, my, it was really one of my proudest moments ever in Hollywood. Uh, needless to say, they determined at that point that I should be assassinated, <laughs> and instead gave me Howie Mandel to do a, a sitcom. Oh, with. So, um, but so uh, then I, I put it away because I was doing other work. But when I finally, when I got to the point where I said, I, you know, my dream was always to be a novelist. I never meant to be in Hollywood. Uh, it's time for me to come home and and do what I should be doing. And this was the these were the first characters who knocked on my door. And with the assistance and encouragement of my phenomenal wife, uh, I sat down and, um, and out they came. So um, here it is. There you go. Uh, so if, if anybody has questions about the story or the, the, the stories that we've read, we're happy to answer them now. We can talk about them later. And any other questions? OK, OK. So. Should we wait for questions till the end? You have a question? It was lovely reading, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> really in unison. Uh, what uh, what was the time frame of from beginning to end of the novel, or at least when the first draft was sent off? You mean in terms of writing it? Yes. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm a I'm a I was a very quick uh, screenwriter, and I'm a very slow novel writer. So it was. I would say it was three or four years. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, some stories, you know, you can write in a minute and a half, and some stories just take you forever. So it was a, it was a long period. He's also, I may say, very particular. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, so there, there are, uh, I explained this, this story about uh, Niccolo and his, uh, his unsuccessful journey to spy on the butcher's beautiful wife in the bathtub. Well, that butcher is the subject. This happens a lot in the book. The, the, the subjects of one story may show up in another. We want to read you now a story about the butcher himself. Um, Thank you. Whose name was Jacopo Scarpacci. The butcher was a man made of meat. Broad-chested, ham-fisted, renowned for his love of mutton and beer, he bestrode his machillary on Piazza Piccola like a braggadocio colossus, half bully, half clown. His manners were crude, his, temperature, his temper legendary, and his nightly visits to the cafe too often ended in drunken arguments and farcical brawls. Despite this, and despite a notoriously heavy finger on the scales, Scar Scarpacci was a master butcher, a valuable thing in a small town. He worked hard, took pride in his labors, was in turn amply rewarded. And when at the age of almost 40, Jacopo decided to take a wife, he went about it with the zeal and efficiency of a man who had spent his life among livestock. On Monday, he closed his shop and drove away. A week later, when he returned, he brought with him a wife. What a wife. Rumor had it she was a milkman's daughter from Orvieto, acquired by Scarpacci in exchange for two veal calves and a prize heifer. One glance explained this extraordinary sum. The girl was beautiful, luxuriant hair, doe-like eyes, achingly full breasts and hips, and a complexion befitting a milkman's daughter. Most of all, she was young, fully 20 years younger than the man who had purchased her hand, if not her heart. For though it was clear that Jacopo Scarpacci had fallen in love at first sight, it was not so for the girl who at 16 had pledged her heart to a boy from a neighboring farm, whose blonde and sculptured physique stood in stark contrast to that of the swarthy suitor who appeared one day at her father's kitchen, reeking of offal and talking of marriage. Perhaps for this reason, two nights before the hastily scheduled wedding, the girl, whose name was Fabrizia, ran off with her young swain, only to be plucked by her father from an outgoing train at the last minute. 
the swain roughly dealt with, and she returned to her home. Undeterred the following evening, she ran off again, this time to be found at dawn, crouched in a neighbor's silo, threatening to do herself in. In spite of these trivial acts of youthful rebellion, however, neither Scarpacci nor Fabrizio's father was discouraged. The deal was a deal, the terms were good, and the girl, though initially reluctant, was surely bound in the long run to honor her father's words. So, after a wedding made notable by the groom's consumption of ale and the bride's fountain of tears, Jacopi Scarpacci returned that day to Piazza Santa Carina Piccolo to show off his inamorata, enjoying the envious glances of other men, among whom it was agreed that the blockhead of a butcher had done very well, though perhaps the women, had they been consulted, would have said otherwise. That evening, in preparation for his wedding night, Scarpacci took a bath, and having scented himself with cologne and donned a fresh nightshirt, climbed the stairs to the bedroom to join his bride in the pleasures of matrimonial bliss. To his surprise, he found the door locked. After some minutes of cajoling, threatening, and pleading, the new husband put his foot to the door and kicked it down, only to find himself confronted with a scowl and a carving knife. Batene, said the object of his desires, go away. Undaunted, Scarpacci stepped forward, only to discover the bride's skills with the knife somewhat greater than expected. When the first swipe removed the buttons from his nightshirt, he felt the need to explain. I am the husband, he bellowed. You are the wife. Obey. A second swipe with the knife sent the nightshirt to his knees. One step closer, explained his one and only, and I will split you open gizzard to gut and turn you into a steer. Jacopo weighed his options. Perhaps, he reasoned, the girl needed more time. It was true they had only recently been introduced. I'll be back in an hour, he offered. When hell freezes over, she offered. So it was that on the night of his wedding, Jacopo Scarpacci made his bed on a cot in the barn while the apple of his eye slept with a knife beneath her pillow. Now naturally, a man of Jacopo's reputation was reluctant to breathe a word of this to his fellow townsmen. Appearances to a man who sells meat meant everything. She won't leave me alone, he bragged at night at the cafe. We couple like rabbits. Then why aren't you at home, asked Bruno Fabro. Echo, a man needs sustenance, Scarpacci boasted. Yea, best wet out watch if Fox doesn't sneak into the hutch while the buck's not watching, whispered Panzarino, the anarchist, loud enough for Scar Scarpacci to hear, which led to a round of fisticuffs and broken platters. In his more sober moments, however, Jacopo, though not given to deep reflection, pondered his plight with a lover's ardent concern. Perhaps he'd been too gruff. Perhaps a tone of gentle kindness would unlock his tender bride's heart among other things. With that in mind, for the next few days, he proved a model of attentiveness, showering his beloved with thoughtful kindnesses and lavish praise. She ignored them. He bought her flowers. She chopped them to pieces. He bought her gifts. She threw them away. In desperation, he went to the priest for advice. Two veal calves and a heifer, said Don Federico. In the privacy of the confessional, this must be quite a wife. She won't obey. Bluted, bladed Scarpacci. Get her pregnant, Don Federico suggested. That often seems to work. To work, to which Jacopo gave no reply. Given the knife beneath the bride's pillow, pregnancy was also out of the question. Failing that, continued Don Federico, prayer is all the Lord provides when it comes to women. Prayer and patience. Say 150 our fathers and hope for the best. A powerful man rendered helpless by the arrows of love, Scarpacci returned to his barn with nothing more than patience and prayer to leaven his loneliness. Prayer, however, is seldom a match for frustration, which shortly begets distrust. Seeds of suspicion began to sprout in Scarpacci's heart. Perhaps Fabro had been right. Perhaps there was a fox lurking outside the hutch, a young man to which he pledged herself, hidden in the shadows, or someone else among the many men coveting her as she stood all day in the doorway of the shop, a far-off look in her eye, as if waiting for some noble Galahad to come to her rescue. Then occurred a puzzling incident involving several small boys lurking on the fire escape outside his window as Scarpacci took his weekly bath. The matter became a source of merriment in the cafe, the upshot being that Scarpacci had nearly been cuckolded by a band of cherubs. It was all he could take. The next week, he put Fabrizia in his truck and drove away. A day later, they were back. Don't complain to me, the bride's father had smirked when he sat milking the dairy cow Scarpacci had supplied as part of the wedding dowry. That girl is willful, pig-headed. Why on earth would I want her back? 
when Scarpacci appealed to a sense of fairness, the dairyman scoffed. Fairness, he said, is made of air. This cow is made of milk. In desperation, Scarpacci offered a bribe, a lifetime supply of mutton and ham. The dairyman scoffed. You made a bargain, now live with it. And those were his words as he slammed the barn doors shut. Thus bound to each other by law, if not by the bounds of love, Jacopo and Fabrizio returned to his shop on Piazza Piccolo, where, having no other choice, they settled into domestic life. She in her bed up the stairs, he on his cot in the barn. Thwarted in his attempts at love, Jacopo immersed himself in the business he knew, that of slaughter, while Fabrizio resumed her post in the butcher shop doorway, awaiting a rescue which, as time went by, seemed less and less likely. Evenings, having locked her inside the shop, Jacopo would repair to the cafe to drown his regrets in tankards of beer and fisticuffs. No longer did he brag about his beautiful wife. Instead, like a man saddled with bad investments, he drank to forget. Then each night, when he arrived home, they fought. What fights? Even to a population used to the trumpets of marital discord, the Scarpacci's nightly battles inspired awe. From midnight to dawn, the piazza echoed with their threats and recriminations. Scarpacci bellowed, Fabrizia howled. He roared, she spat, dishes clattered and smashed. Surely people agreed, this couldn't go on. But things got worse. A loose board on the cellar stairs, a frayed electrical wire in the pantry, a scorpion in the bathtub, a black snake in the yard. Perhaps these were coincidences. Perhaps a relationship so toxic was bound to generate insects and adders all on its own. It was if, it was as if, lacking love, the marriage was fueled by spot and hostility, spite and hostility. Where other couples held hands, the Scarpaches threw pots. In place of a kiss, the back of a hand. Like heavyweight boxers in a fight with no bell, it was a case of the last man standing. Sooner or later, all agreed, one of them would fall, by dint of sabotage, foul play, or simple exhaustion. As it happened, it was none of those. Neither murder nor malice, but the horn of an angry bull. The bull's horn plunged deep into Jacobo's abdomen, turned with a twist and exited, leaving behind a gaping wound. By the time Scarpacci's stockman had carried him across the yard and up the stairs, the doctor had arrived at the scene. The doctor examined Jacopo's wound, then folded his stethoscope and turned to Fabrizia, who stood in the bedroom doorway smoking a cigarette. Call the priest, he said. There's nothing I can do. He closed his bag and left, leaving Fabrizia alone in the doorway while Jacopo turned from pale to ashen to deathly gray. After a while, his eyes opened and met hers. I have not been much of a husband, he rasped, and you have not been much of a wife. Still, I suppose we did what we could. Now, I release you. Do what you will. Again, his eyes closed. For some minutes more, Fabrizio stood in the doorway as Jacopo's breathing became shallower. Perhaps she was thinking of the mess he made of the bed. Perhaps she was thinking of the young swain in her past to whom she had pledged her soul, but who, she had come to realize, would never come to claim her. Or perhaps she remembered the day a stranger, reeking of barnyard and slaughterhouse, covered with hair, stood in her father's kitchen, eyes alight with love, and asked for her hand. As if she, no more than a willful milkmaid, were all the treasures of the world and more wrapped into one. A moment longer she stood, then she put out her cigarette and, stepping into the room, shut the door behind her. When minutes later, Monsignor Federico climbed the stairs to anoint Scarpacci's soul for heaven, he found the door locked. Somewhat taken aback, he knocked. Sono ye, he cried. Don Federico. Vatene, came a worldman's reply. Go away. After some minutes more of knocking, the priest put his foot to the door and kicked it open, only to find himself confronted with two bodies in bed, one deathly pale, the other a startlingly healthy pink. I said, get out, said Fabrizia, the pink one. I am the priest, replied the priest, obey. Fabrizia threw back the blanket, revealing her exquisite and utter nakedness. When hell freezes over, she countered. Clutching his sacraments, the Monsignore fled. What transpired in the minutes and hours that followed out of sight of the dubious world, what alchemy of touch and caress, tenderness and desire, Grit and determination can, without witnesses, only be surmised. How it was that a dairyman's daughter managed, without benefit of surgery, other than the crude stitches she herself administered, to heal so severe a wound seemed to some miraculous, though to others it smacked of witchcraft. 
Still others who understood the true nature of love and a lover's wounds could only shake their heads in, I don't know in wonder name. that such an improbable thing could occur in a place as unlikely as a butcher shop on a small square in a meaningless town in the middle of nowhere. Though perhaps only in such a place could such a thing happen. Scarpacci did not die of his wounds that night, nor the next. When after a week the doctor was once again summoned, he predicted the full recovery of the same man he had left for dead days earlier. Even more surprisingly, the following morning, to everyone's shock, the Magellaria stood open for business. Behind the counter, an apron and cap, wielding a cleaver, trimming the fat, balancing the scales, stood the butcher's wife, who was known to be deft with a knife. By the end of the week, with the help of Scarpacci's stockmen, Fabrizia had taken up the chores of slaughtering and was reported to be a quick study. In a very short time, while her husband continued his long recuperation, her skills as a butcher came to rival even his. Meanwhile, late at night, the resounding arguments of the past gave way to whispers of delight, as Fabrizia granted Chichicopo the tenderness he had so long desired. In return for her ministrations, he produced an outpouring of gratitude which became, in within weeks, a swelling in her. Can such a thing happen? Can it be that from such rack and ruin might come such a sweet peace? Perhaps this outcome was too big, good to be true. Perhaps in years to come, Jacopo and Fabrizia grew bored with their bliss and once again fought like dogs. Then again, it is possible, though unlikely, that Fabrizia grew fat and ungainly, bearing children like apples from a tree, and when the boy from her youth arrived at last to claim her, he took one look and quietly slipped away. It is almost certainly not true that some years later, war having arrived, a particular group in Führer and his staff were invited to dine at the loyal Scarpacci's table only later to discover the meal they eat, they'd eaten had consisted of the butcher himself, chopped and minced along with a generous serving of arsenic and rat poison, <laughs> after which the butcher's wife was not seen again until the war's end, when Fabrizio Scarpacci emerged at the forefront of haute cuisine in the booming post-Swiss War culinary industry. In the absence of proof, however, any of these things might have occurred. After half a decade of war, as with everything else on Piazza Piccolo, only possibilities remained. So one guess is as good as another. Choose your poison. <laughs> so, thank you. So the, the tone of the book is what, what they call magical realism, which is uh, uh, clearly these things may or may not have happened. But my thought, and I thought the, the powerful thing about, about approaching these stories with that may or may not have ever been able to happen, is that we all, uh, our memories are all based on landmarks from our past. And when those landmarks for a small boy of eight are completely wiped away, he has nothing really to work on except the rumors and thoughts and few memories he has of the place. So in a way, anything fantastic can be true in these stories. Uh, are there, does anybody want to ask some more questions? Should we do another one? or? Well, at least we'll okay. do another one. We'll do another one. <laughs> now we're back to uh, we're back to Nicola, Nicolo, who uh, who is still uh, trying to find trying to recover the head of the Statue of Liberty, which has fallen into a sewer grate, uh, and uh, is very worried about it. I think is this you? Can you be I don't know. Who should it be? You go. Okay. Eight, this is La Bafana. Eight days before Christmas, the good Christians of the piazza, farmers and merchants, thieves and apostles, neighbors and nemeses, squeezed together into the pews of Santo Bartolomeo Santo Bartolomeo Giusto. Who wrote that? Amid the sound of bells and the smell of incense and cow manure, Monsignor Don Federico intoned the prayers of the novena. And from the back pew, the fool Fausto howled his fervent responses. Mama and Nicolo attended. Nano stayed home, having reached an age where he knew better. After Mass, Mama and Nicolo lit candles in honor of Mama's, Mama's family and for Papa, who was far away. Mama said each candle was a prayer that God himself would answer. When her eyes were closed, Nicolo lit a candle and prayed for the safe recovery of his broken statue, half of which lay entombed beneath the storm drain in the piazza. Perhaps, Nicolo suggested, God might intercede, even speak to La Bafana, the wandering gift giver, who brought presents to all good children on Epiphany Eve. 
Nicolo hissed Mama, looking over. Don't shut your eyes so tight, your head will burst. See, si, Mama, said Nicolo. His prayer, he knew, was futile. La Bafana brought gifts to good children only. For the others, the bad ones, she left onions and coal. The fact was, with a ragged broomstick and searching eyes, La Bafana frightened Nicolo. Each year, he made sure to sleep with Mama until the specter had come and gone, although this year he made up his mind that he wouldn't. Despite these concerns, for Niccolo, the days before Natale were filled with music and light, most of all with good things to eat. The bakery shelves burst with honeyed strofoli and sugary cenzi, cenci, and marzipan fruits and pandoro. At school, Maestro Leonora had the children dressed in sandals and shepherd's hats and go from classroom to classroom <laughs> playing songs on shepherd's pipes. One afternoon at the pharmacia, beneath the nose of Baldoni, the nearsighted pharmacist, Niccolo and his friends filled their pockets with candy and then hid in, in Rinaldo's outhouse and feasted till Quindice got sick. One night it snowed, and they made angels in the drifts beneath the statues of Garibaldi. Most exciting of all, the arrival of the season had brought the sounds of saws and hammers to the square, where a team of men, led by Abel Basevi, the carpenter, began to work on the platform to hold the presepio, the annual nativity scene. The whole town pitched in, hauling lumber, fitting joists, delivering bales of hay, Nano climbed, high, Nano climbed high on the rafters to hang strings of colored lights. Nicola was allowed to hold the nails. Fausto, who considered himself in charge of all things on the piazza, took a proprietary role, hounding the workmen, barking orders, and waving his arms, ridiculous in his aviator's cap. When the manger was complete, it was time to retrieve from Mabel Basevi's workshop the, holy, the figures of the Holy Family, carved in wood by Basevi's grandfather decades ago. The workshop up the hill from the bakery and overlooking the distant mountains had been occupied by Abel's family for as long as anyone knew, perhaps for centuries. Large oaken doors opened into a cavernous studio populated by snarling saws, rattling lathes, and workbenches laden with axes, chisels, braces, and files. Here, among piles of sawdust and the reek of carpenter's glue, Abel and his assistant performed their craftsman's alchemy transforming humble boards into graceful swan-like forms, cabinets and bedsteads, tables and chairs. But to Niccolo, the true magic waited in the darkness of the storage bins in the far corner of the studio. Looming in the shadows, silent, abiding, stood great wooden figures larger than life, the holy family awaiting their annual summons to the piazza. Joseph the father, his brow furrowed with burden. The magi and the shepherds, wide-eyed and believing, the donkey, the camel, the winged angels, most of all Mary, beautiful and serene, whose breast throw flew through, whose breast through her flowing robes as she, why, why am I reading that? Whose, whose breast through her flowing robes as she knelt before the young savior's grip, caused a curious itch in Niccolo's loins. Finally, nesting in the curving, arc-like safety of his crib lay the infant Jesus, swaddled against the cold of the Bethlehem night, a fine layer of sawdust perched on the curve of his tiny halo. One by one, the massive figures were lifted from their bins by Abel and his men and carried into the sunlight of day to be roped into place on the wagon. Then it was down the hill toward the square, cartwheels reel, rattling on cobblestone, the wooden figures bound and jostling, struggling to maintain their dignity, while a crowd of schoolchildren who had been given the afternoon off from school shouted and pranced alongside like wild pagans. To some, the scene with its raucous crowd and tumbrel full of stoic prisoners seemed reminiscent of certain long-ago public executions, though surely such barbarism had long ago come and gone. Having reached the piazza, the figures, all but the infant Jesus himself, who would not be delivered until Christmas Eve, were set into position in the manger, accompanied by the usual arguments over which peace went where, as well as whispered jokes concerning the camel and the sheep. All while, Fausto, pretending to be a wise man himself, strutted across the stage and, egged on by the men, showered blessings on the crowd. Wise man, my ass, shouted Fabro, the stable master. Keep him away from the camel, yelled De Campo the mason. Laughter rose all around as Fausto mugged. Yid, called a voice next to Niccolo, and the laughter continued anyway as if no one had heard or cared to hear. The Nano on the stage turned to look. The man who had shouted turned to the group he was with and said loudly for everyone to hear, the woodcarver's a Jew. What business does he have in our holiday? He pointed to the platform. Jew statues. Jew, Jew statues. Maybe someone should look in the crib, huh? At the mention of which, the holy child and the other men in black shirts snickered. One or two spat on the cobblestones. On the platform, Nano set down his hammer. 
but the young red men were already moving off. On the platform, Abel Bassevi appeared not to have taken notice, so it was hard to tell if he'd heard. When the black shirts were gone, the laughter and good natured joking resumed, and Fausto pretended to fall in love with the camel, and the incident was forgotten, or nearly so. Then evening came, and Nano connected the wires to the colored lights. The square lit up in miraculous hues, and the wooden statues came alive with a heavenly glow, their days of exile triumphantly redeemed. Monsignor Federico arrived to bless the scene, and Signore Michelli, the manicurist who had once sung at La Scala, or so she said, knelt at the platform and trilled Ave Maria, while the sky turned from deep purple to black. Later that night, in the rooms above the bakery, Nano lighted the Yule log, the chet boat, and Niccolo stared into the fire for hours. In the fire, he saw many things, sometimes a lion or a battle scene, armies fighting and towers falling in flames, then Papa walking the streets of New York, alone in the great and mysterious city. Niccolo, said Mama, what are you thinking about? Niente, said Niccolo. Mama laughed, all that staring for nothing? My poor little empty-headed boy. And she hugged him and put him to bed. Will Papa have Christmas, he asked. Everyone has Christmas, said Mama. She kissed him and pulled up the sheet. By now, Niccolo was very sleepy. Mama, he said, il cazzone di Gesù. Is it like mine or a Jew's? Mama took him to the sink and washed his mouth out with soap. Christmas Eve was a day of fasting. All morning, Rinaldo and Quindici loitered in the piazza while their mothers began to prepare the cenone, the Christmas meal to be served the next day. Until then, there would be nothing to eat but fish soup. Nano offered Niccolo a pinch of tobacco to quell his appetite, but Niccolo, suspecting a trap, refused. In the afternoon, Nano and Basevi delivered the infant Jesus to the manger. Niccolo rode in the cart. When no one was looking, he snuck a glance at the baby's cazone. Folded in its skin, it was hard to tell if it was a breo or not. By dark, the weather had turned windy and cold. Outside, beneath the glare of the electric lights on the platform, the holy family huddled, isolated and exposed, at the mercy of innkeepers and unchristian kings, while in the bakery it was warm and smelled of marzipan and anisette and succulent meats and the perfume of candles as Nano by the stove recited to Niccolo and Mama the old and compelling legends of many years past. And it seemed to Niccolo that God's presence grew close and pressed inward upon them, the ineffable proof of his goodness, his gifts and his unend and unending mercies hovering over each household, over each mother and child. Then shouts came from the square, a flickering of light on the walls, and everyone ran to see the Presepio in flames. The fire rode up from the, rode, roared up from the hay bales, paused briefly to gauge its own strength, then sprang across the platform forum onto the backs of the camel and sheep, which trembled, then burst into light, the camel drooping slowly to its knees, the sheep stock still as if transfixed by a brilliant dawn. Relentless, the flames reached the wall of the manger and engulfed the shepherds, climbing their staffs to ignite the angels' wings, then the poor angels themselves, who might have flown but stayed to protect their Lord. In the gathering crowd, there were shouts for water. Men were already approaching with buckets. As Niccolo and Mama raced across the square, the piazza glowed with a hideous light. The fire overtook the wise men and crept toward the cradle where Joseph and Mary, intent on their adorations, knelt in worship, oblivious to all else. Then they too were blazing pyres, dark smoke billowing into heaven as overhead the string of lights came loose and descended, bulbs still flickering. Impossibly in the roaring fire was a man, alive, ablaze, dancing in the flames. Ah, oh, cried the crowd in astonishment. The figure, shepherd or wise man, seemed to be brought to life by the fire, lurched from the back of the stable, hair and clothes lit, arms flailing, spinning like a dervish toward the burning cradle. A board underneath gave way. Oh, mind this, moaned the spectators. The thing stang staggered forward, lifted the baby Jesus from his cradle, then infant in arms staggered ahead and collapsed at the edge of the platform. Hands reached up from the crowd to pull him to safety and plucked from his head his fiery aviator's cap. Seconds later, the, the stage collapsed in a shower of sparks, swallowing with one great groaning gulp Grandfather Basevi's wooden family. The fire burned all night, despite the best efforts of Municipal Engine Company No. 2, who left the scene at midnight having coated Piazza Piccolo with a dangerous sheet of ice. In the gray fog of dawn, Don Federico and Don Tommaso made their way across the treacherous stones to bless the wreckage, particularly the remains of the Savior Child, 
blistered and charred, which had been left to burn itself out in the very spot where, some days before, snow angels had been laid. As for Fausto, Lo Stolto, who had gone to sleep in the manger and awakened half in flames, his escape with minor burns seemed miraculous, though it is probable his many layers of filthy rags and le leather aviator's cap had more to do with his quick recovery than providence. The next afternoon it snowed again, extinguishing the last of the embers and covering the square in a merciful shroud of white. Ten days later, on the Feast of the Epiphany, the wreckage had been swept and cleared, though on the pavement could still be seen ghostly images of Pesevi's sculptures, charred into the stones, darkly foreshortened, as if reaching up from below. Despite these events, or perhaps because of them, the feast seemed more festive than ever. In church, the revelation of God the Son as a human being was announced by Don Filippo with more than usual flamboyance. After Mass, Niccolo walked with his grandfather up the hill to Abel Besevi's workshop. The gates hung open, the studio stripped, the place abandoned. Nono made up a story that Abel had gone to live with his family in Bologna, but Niccolo saw through it. How, he reasoned, could Besevi's family be elsewhere when they'd lived in this place for 200 years? Scrawled on the gates in white paint were the words Ebreo and Yid. Chicosa, Niccolo said to his grandfather. Nono shook his head and kicked some stones. Chilosa, he said, who knows? Then they walked back, back down the hill to town. That night, Nicola hung his stockings in expectation of the visit from La Bafana, who had, on a starlit evening long ago, failed to accompany the wise men to Bethlehem and was therefore fated to roam the world leaving gifts for deserving bambini, although perhaps not for Nicolo. He had heard stories of the willful children who late at night felt the angry thump of Bafana's broom on their backsides, Nevertheless, true to his promise to himself, he went to sleep in his own bed. When the hours went by and he couldn't sleep, he called her mama, who was never far away, who came and sang to him in her gentle voice. Niccolo felt his eyes grow heavy and his fears indistinct as her voice surrounded him in this most impermanent crash, under the stars, with danger lurking all around. She comes from the mountains in the deep of night. Look how tired she is, all wrapped up in snow and frost and the north wind. Vienne, Vienne, La Bafana. That's the end. So we can do one more, or how are we? Well, the pa all we have left is the passeggiata. Right. Should we do that? Well, what do you think? Let's do it. Okay. This is our, our short conclusion to the story, so that we can maybe do some questions or answers right. or sing songs or whatever. <laughs> you, me. I think it's you. Oh, okay. La Passeggiata. Around evening, the long day, which began with such promise, staggers to an end and lays down exhausted in the dust. A single step short of victory. In the fading light, Donati the goat herd urges his stragglers across an uncrowded square. The final customer climbs from Vigio's barber chair. In the bakery, Mama sets the last of the breads to cool, wipes her hands on her apron, and goes about preparing Nicolo's supper. The sun relinquishes her territories. The street lights come on. For the briefest part of an hour, stillness settles across the piazza. Then, so it seems to the boy, a sort of miracle. The nightly passeggiata begins. From doorways and alleyways down hilly streets that lead to the square, the citizens of Piazza Santa Caterina Piccolo appear, arm in arm, transformed by the adv advent of evening. Combed, bathed, and scented, they stroll past the shops, greeting friends, sharing gossip, defying the day's difficulties. <coughs> Their laughter rising among pools of electric light. <coughs> Everyone comes to see and be seen, bachelors seeking brides, girls with their secret smiles, widows and widowers, ledgers and prudes, husbands and wives who walk without saying a word. From the apartment windows flow music, Puccini, Caruso, Benny Goodman, Louis Armstrong, opera and jazz on gramophones and radio sets. In the lamp and air, the melodies blend together, at once discordant and triumphant, hovering over the murmur of voices below. To Niccolo, it seems as if a greater hand is at work, a painter's brush, softening the light, deepening the hues, rendering each woman more profound, each man less coarse, precisely as, at their best, they wish to be. Later, behind closed doors, among squalling children and the burdens of labor and debt, the endless bickering resumes, the furtive coupling, the drunken cruelties, the slap of hand across face, the muffled cries of loneliness and loss. 
But for now, in this single, beautified hour, part of the tradition more beautiful than themselves, the people walk, then the music plays, while far off, wolves howl in the, howl in the darkened mountains. And again, the, the wolves that are howling are the, the echoes of war, the bombs, the, uh, the machine guns, they're going to come and uh, remove this blessed place from its existence. Um, so that's what we have. That's a, that's a kind of a survey of the book. And, uh, and, and Mary Grazzi for coming. Um, well, I thought of about four different things, if I can remember them, that have to do with, uh, with you and a, and a process. I mean, I suppose writing a novel is, has got similarities with writing a show like Wonder Years, but, but it's probably very different as it is, well. It is very, very different. The thing about screenwriting or television writing is that Form is really the, the form is really the, you, you have a certain amount of time, you have a three act, usually a three act format to go through, or depending on how many commercials your TV, your TV shows. Yeah, and, right. uh, and you need to tell a, a story quickly and efficiently uh, and have it over with. Uh, and you've got deadlines. What? And you've got deadlines. And you've got deadlines, absolutely. Yeah. So it's do you approach... Be, the, the show is going to shoot next Tuesday. Yeah. The, the lights are going to be on. The actors are going to be on stage. And the question is, is there going to be a script in their hands or not? Yeah, yeah. So with a novel, it's entirely different. At least my experience in writing novels is that the story and the characters dictate your pace and dictate what happens next. And your, your job as a novelist is really to... Uh, give them the space and follow their lead and find out what the story is inside them. So it's, it's, a, it's I have to say, I, I think I said this before, I was actually known to be a pretty quick writer uh, in, in the screenwriting and TV writer business, but I am immensely slow on this. And, and patience is, patience and schedule and discipline are the only answer, so. Do you, do you set yourself a deadline or a timeline for for no, writing? I set, I set myself a, a, a schedule to work, and if I can get a couple of paragraphs written, that's a great thing. If you can write a page a day, at the end of the day, you have, at the end of the year, you have 365 pages. So, yeah. Um, and one other thing, what was it? Um, do, do, you, do you sketch out the arc of the novel sort of ahead of time? Like, these are gonna be my characters, they're gonna, yeah, these are my. These guys are going to be towards the beginning. These guys towards the end, and then I'm going to go fill in what they all do. Or is it yeah, I would a say, story at a time I would say that comes? Novel to writing you. is more following the thread rather than the, than the details. That that I, certainly I think before you start, you have an idea of what your entry point is, what the complications are. Although you may not have any idea what the ultimate uh, outcome is. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Your writing is like poetry. I've been lucky enough to be, to have been in Italy a few times, and I think part of the magic of Italy is that it slows you down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when you go to Italy, where do you like to stay? Well, uh, or visit? The, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's such a sucker punch because we all love to go to Tuscany. Uh, the, uh, I think that this, I'm guessing that this uh, photo here, I'm pretty sure, is from San Gemignano in Tuscany, which uh, many of you may have visited. It's famous for its towers, which uh, were, were built, uh, these, these tall towers were built by the patron, the, the wealthy patrons in a kind of a competition which is not unlike what's happening in Manhattan today, if you've been down there. So, but it is, uh, 
there's a place uh, that I would recommend, we would recommend, in, uh, I think it's the town of Sinalunga, called, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. talking about the place we stayed in Sinalunga. I don't remember. Locanda de la Marosa. Locanda de la Marosa. Uh, but, I mean, there, Italy has so many delights. You know, the, the, the amazing thing about the Italian culture, the thing I love so much is that the Italians have been conquered so many times. They have, they have this, such a vibrant and rich history and culture. They have such a sense of resignation to the way life is, such a brave, really it's this valorous sense of, of picking up and moving on, and they have a great sense of humor about themselves. Unlike, for instance, the French, or even, should we say, the Americans, <laughs> you know? They are, they are really just a wonderfully humble and funny culture. And uh, so I find that no matter where you go, you find that. You find that in the marketplaces, you know, you find that in, in wherever you stay, that there is a, this kind of open welcomeness and sense of we're all in this together. That is uh, a beautiful thing. I think also that art also surrounds you in Italy, just kind of everywhere you go. I remember we were, we went to Rome for Christmas with and took the kids, and I think your sister came, and mm -hmm. we rented an apartment near the Spanish Steps. And it turns out that this apartment was next door to a music school, and across the street from that was an opera center. And every day, you didn't even have to go outside to hear this. It just wafted in the windows. And it was just so lovely and amazing and beautiful to see. Um, and we spent New Year's Eve at the Spanish Steps. And I thought, oh, we're going to die. <laughs> it was so crowded. And there's just fireworks going off everywhere and insane. But it was all part of the life. And it was, and it was fun. And then uh, traveling anywhere down the Amalfi Coast, which is, is beautiful. And uh, Pompeii with its... With its uh, unbelievable history and, and architecture. And it's in the, the, Pompeii's been in the headlines again this week because they found a whole new, uh, a whole new villa to, to excavate. So I forgot the question. Well, where to go? I would say anywhere in Italy is. Uh... Yes, I like Doug's question, so I was going to follow up on that because I'm always interested in process. Um, so it seems like the stories are very character driven. And it sounds like what you were doing when you were screenwriting was very character driven as well. So I was wondering if you would talk a little bit more about well, I'm that. I'm sorry, what we were doing where? Character driven. Yeah, but you see. That when screenwriting. you were screenwriting, right. it was all about following those characters as well. Yeah, I think that's so. probably my, that's my interest is, is in the whatever human beings are going to do next. And uh, I think for me, there's, there's also, uh, a, a, just a sense of the magic of existence that uh, the, the loveliness of what could be if we all if we were all everything we wanted to be yeah. and uh, the and for me the other thing is because I you know I, I began my life as a composer and wrote uh, Broadway shows and wow. thought of myself as a serious musician and then I moved to screenwriting I mean to not to screenwriting <laughs> Uh, hopefully I moved to literature because I love the music in words and uh, th th you know w great writing is, is melodies uh, and so for me I think that those two combinations I do love characters and I, and I love um, turning words into music. When, when you were screenwriting you were making up the characters then as well right? <laughs> As well yes, as in your fiction. Sure, if you're if you're studio head, and if, you know, if, the, if the, the 50 people that the uh, network is sending to, or the movie studio is sending to tell you that uh, it's not funny enough, or it's too funny, or this will never work. I mean, screenwriting is also a dodgeball act in Hollywood. <laughs> that, you know, except of course I must say when the, when the, I, I say that, but the, the, the fact is that when for some of the shows that I where I ran the show and I was in charge of the show. That was, uh, that was a whole different process. That was an act, that was a labor of love. The, the show that won years for me was a, was a real labor of love, so. so don't you also find that, um, that when, you, when, you, when you're, you're writing from characters out, that it's more sort of natural for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
I mean, story, I mean, I, I, now, I think I get the, the, the point of your question, which is because I said that so much, for instance, of television writing is story driven. And, uh, and, and, and it is hard. And I think that for me probably was the, the, the reason I wasn't entirely satisfied doing it because you, you, have to make, you have to make so many economical choices and keep it simple, stupid, you know, so. I guess building on that, Bob, um, I'm just curious, like, how, how difficult was it to switch over from, like, the bare bones of screenwriting to, like, you know, the beautiful detail that, that you have in, in your yeah. novel writing? It, it was, it, I came as a surprise to me. But I did have the I did have the advantage of the, I had these characters who had been in my head for so long that I had thought deeply about all of them. I mean, I, I, maybe not good for you, but I wish I could read you all the stories because there's such a there's such a difference in the characters and the way that they move together. The, I'll get back to this, but the, we read the story about the pickpocket lifting the strands of grief from the girl at the cafe. There's a story about the girl at the cafe and how she came to be there, so that everything kind of interconnects and intertwines. So on this one, I had a real head start because I had 30 years to think about it. But I, I'm at work right now on two novels, which are, it's like chiseling it out of granite to, to, uncover, uh, to uncover what's really going on there. So I, I find it, uh, writing novels is hard. <laughs> you know? I don't know if this is a question so much as just an observation, but I found this novel very cinematic. That is to say, um, and I mean, I think I've observed this in my life anyway. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I think that for people who both enjoy reading and enjoy movies, there is a kind of way that um, sometimes the movies that I love best are movies that have a no novelistic quality to them, and um, or or TV series that have that sort of you know the characters develop as if in a novel that kind of thing. And I think this the reverse is true here that there um, the language you use is so evocative that there are beautiful, beautiful pictures. And I can see somebody wanting to make a movie of it. And then I think to myself, what would that be like for you to have somebody else take over that job? That's you know? why I said, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Because on a movie, the writer is the lowest form of life. If, if the writer is allowed to be on the set, it's a big deal. And forget about being invited to opening night. Not going to happen. But uh, first of all, no cynic in you about right. that. first of all, thank I, you. know, I've got a light in my eye. I can't really see who's asking, who I'm talking to, but I love you for, <laughs> <laughs> for that, for those kind words. That's so nice. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that we're, we've considered uh, doing something, uh, doing something on film for it, but because of, the, because of the kind of magical realism nature of it, one of the things that we're working on, we're working with artists on, is to find out if we can find a way to do it as an animated piece. Not, you know, not, uh, not like the Simpsons or something like that, but something with a little, a little uh, more evanescent kind of thing, but whether it could be an animated piece. But we'll see, I mean, I'm, I'm it's, it's funny, this is my baby and I, I'm happy if, if nothing happens and I, I think I would be of two minds if uh, somebody came to me and said, uh, we want to shoot it because as you say, uh, depending on who's got the money, it depends yeah. on who's got the control over the process, so. But maybe it could be, uh, you know, we could go right in there with Barbie and Bob and Oppenheimer, yeah. who knows, so.